Hello everybody, welcome to the Frontline Club. Uh, I'm Millicent, the programme editor. Uh, thank you for coming this evening. Um, before I hand over to Oliver Cam, if you can uh, switch your phones to silent, and when it comes to questions, if you can wait for the microphone because we are broadcasting live. Over to Oliver. Thank you, Millicent. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you for coming out on this inclement evening. I'm delighted to welcome Anne Applebaum, historian, journalist, author, with particular reference this evening to her latest book, um, Iron Curtain, The Crushing of Eastern Europe, 1944 to 1956. It has garnered many superlatives, a small sample of which are from me. And <laughs> uh, it is a, an exhaustive account, um, but a, a, a compulsively readable one, of how a band of proud, independent nations in Central and East, Eastern Europe fell under Soviet tutelage in a very short time. And we're going to talk about the themes arising from this book and indeed from Anne's earlier work, um, a book called Gulag, A History of the Soviet Camps. And I'm going to start with this, Anne, because when I was reading your later book, your more recent book, you refer, uh, there's a wealth of detail in it, but you refer to the show trials in Eastern Europe that um, roughly span 1949 to 1953, and you refer back to um, the Moscow show trials in the 1930s of Bukharin and others, and you refer to the little Stalins who were in charge in Eastern Europe by that time. To what extent, clearly the um, autocracies in Central and Eastern Europe were dictated by and modelled on Stalinist repression. But to what extent in your research for Iron Curtain did you see in it or did you find the germs for it in your earlier work on Gulag? Um, thank you very much, first of all, and thank you so much for being here and again for all of you coming out on this cold but not actually very snowy night. I, I landed in London this morning from Washington expecting blizzards and snowstorms and, you know, what we know from Siberia and Eastern Europe, and I was stunned to discover half an inch of snow on the ground uh, <laughs> and mass hysteria. Um, also, thank you, thank you, Oliver. Um, who, Oliver has written very nice things about my book, and I see he has a suitable, properly faded copy of Gulag with him, which strikes me as very authentic. Um, the yes, there there is a connection in my head between the two books, although it's not a precise connection. Uh, in in some ways, the origins of my book on the Iron Curtain, which is a book about the totalitarianization of Eastern Europe after the Second World War arose from my work on the previous book. You know, while, while working on the Gulag book, one of the subjects that most intrigued me and that I tried to read the most about and had actually, it, it's one of the hardest subjects to find out about, was the question of who were the camp guards, what motivated them, and why did they go along with it? And I, if, I, I, I won't tell you the whole story now. I tried to put together what were the elements of their mentality, um, you know, they, you know they, 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 did they believe they were acting legally? The answer, of course, is that is yes. Who, you know, what did they think they were doing in carrying out these acts of cruelty? And, but, of course, it, one doesn't get the full answer to the question just by studying a group of camp guards in the Soviet Union in a certain period. And I got interested in the wider question of what, why did anybody go along with totalitarianism and what were the sort of institutional and and emotional and psychological building blocks of it. And that subject was really what led me to the question of 1945 or 1944, depending on which country we're talking about, and what drew people into, um, you know, the, the Soviet totalitarian, Soviet style totalitarianism was essentially imposed in stages on a whole group of countries after World War II, many of which were very, very different and had in fact, they were all very, very different, and they had totally different political and economic backgrounds. You know, they range from post-Nazi Germany to Poland, which had fought the Nazis very bravely for 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 for, for five years, um, to the Czechs, to the Albanians, to the Romanians. You know, these are all very different countries, different languages, different religions, different cultures, and yet in this very brief period of time, 
the Soviet Union managed, at least for, for a short time, to create what would have looked to the outsiders in the year 1950 like little identikit states, you know, where everybody was behaving in the same way, and there were the same kinds of posters on the buildings and the same kinds of parades. So the question was, how did that happen? What were the, what was the technique? What were the elements of it? What was the psychological method? And that that was the question that led to the start of the book. So sorry, that was a long answer, but that. That's how the books are connected in my head. They're both about that mentality. Well, let's go to the start of the book. And you set the scene in 1944, 1945, as you say, depending on the country. And you write there about the, I paraphrase, but the radical loneliness of people in Eastern and Central Europe faced with the complete devastation of war, not only the physical destruction, but the collapse of social relations that of, of the sense of the rule of law. And describe the scene for us um, uh, in, these, in these dark days, these last days of the Second World War. It's, it's hard. I mean, I'm, now I'm looking at a post, looks like Grozny or somewhere. I mean, that, that's, that could have been Warsaw in 1945, except that those buildings wouldn't have been standing. Um, ma many of these, you know, the, 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 first of all, the level of physical destruction in Eastern Europe was far beyond what we knew in Western Europe, even compared to London or Coventry or cities that had experienced terrible bombing, terrible things happened in the Western half of the continent. But the, the level was, it was kind of five, depending on the country, many times more. And so you had absolutely flat cities. You had totally destroyed transportation systems. You know, you had an economies that didn't function uh, at all. You know, but on top of that, you had something that I, again, came to understand by talking to people who'd lived through this period, which was um, a sense that society had collapsed. So if you were a Pole, and one, one of my most interesting interviews when I was working on this book was with a Polish writer called Tadeusz Konwicki, who became famous later for writing. He, he, was, he was certainly not a communist in his later years, and he wrote very um, funny and anti-communist books. But for a very brief period in the late 1940s and early 50s, he was a Stalinist. And he described that to me. And he said, well, you have to understand, I grew up in a very patriotic family. I was in the Boy Scouts. I was in the Home Army. So that means he was part of the, the anti-Nazi resistance. He was from eastern Poland, near what's now Vilnius. And he had been brought up in this very patriotic, very pro-Polish family that, you know, in, in an era in the 1920s and 30s when Poland had been put back together again, having been broken up for, for, for the, most of the 19th century, all the 19th century. And he, set, and he witnessed, during the war, he witnessed that entire society fall apart. So everything his parents had told him and everything his schools had taught him turned out to be wrong. Nothing was, none of the people who were supposed to protect him were able to protect him. None of the, you know, the army failed, the government failed, society collapsed. Uh, there was, you know, we, we couldn't get rid of Hitler. Uh, and his, he was in this resistance band that first fought the Nazis and actually stayed in the woods for a few weeks afterwards and fought the Russians, the Red Army, as it came into the country, as, as, as some people did in that part of the world. And after a while, he, he, reckon, you know, he began to question that. He saw people were slipping away. And finally, he decided, I, you know, it's pointless. I'm not going to keep doing this. So he walked out of the forest. He, at that time, you could get an amnesty. He got an amnesty and, and tried to rejoin society. He realized there he was, I think he was 19 or 20, and he had nothing. He had no family. He had no education. He owned nothing. He owned the clothes on his back and the little backpack, and that was it. And he thought, I've been fighting for my country for all these years, you know, doing these heroic things, and what's happened? Nothing. I get nothing for it. And that caused a kind of break in his mentality, as, as he described it to me. And he said, well, if everything I've been taught was wrong, you know, maybe the opposite is true. Maybe the communists are right. Maybe they have, they have a more coherent answer to how we should live. And anyway, the Red Army is strong, and they came in, and they were able to defeat the Germans, and we, the Poles by ourselves, were not. And so he so you know, so in the in this blankness and absence of morals and values and everything having disappeared, he became a communist. And I I heard a version of that story from a German as well, from um, Hans Muldrow, who later became a German politician, who also described being a German soldier. He was about sixteen in the Wehrmacht and being captured, and having the same experience. Everything I was taught was wrong. And this was in his case, it was Nazi propaganda. He'd grown up in a Hitler youth and so on. It was all not true. We lost the war. We weren't the superior race. So maybe 
the opposite is true. Maybe, maybe the Russians have the answer that we didn't have. But this social dislocation, this collapse of everything that people believed in, what they've been taught, what they now believed not to be true, this provided, I can see this provided some opportunity for the communist parties or their surrogates in various countries. What I find, I don't wish to keep sounding obsequious about your book, but what I find Go, no, particularly, <laughs> particularly <laughs> fascinating is your dissection of how um, Soviet domination came by stages and the creation of the police state was not all at once. It was, as you say in your, in your first chapter, in your introduction, it was a reaction to failure. So what, what, what were the stages of Soviet repression in the, in the late 1940s? This is an interesting question because, um, as you all know, if you've made the effort to get here this evening, we're talking about very different countries. You know, the Pol Poles and Czechs and Hungarians have different cultures, and they aren't similar to one another. They're even less similar now than they used to be. Um, nevertheless, one of the interesting things about the imposition of communism, even though it had to cope with the, the Red Army and the NKVD had to cope with different conditions in each country, actually, everywhere they went, they used pretty much the same tools. And they were interested from the very beginning in the same set of institutions, which were the institutions they considered to be important, um, which I, I hadn't, before doing the research for this book, I hadn't realized. And they're, depending on, they're, they're really three plus one more. So the three are the secret police. So everywhere they went, from the day one of their arrival, they began to set up secret police forces that were loyal to them. And in the case of some countries, notably Poland, um, but also Hungary and Germany is a little different because it went in different stages, but they, they began to train people to be in the secret police force before they got there. So the, the, or the origins of the Polish secret police are earlier. They begin in 1939 uh, when the Soviet Union invades Eastern Poland and begins training Polish secret policemen at that time. So that's, that to them was a fundamental building block. You know, the party needs eyes and ears. It needs a political police force who can, if needed, exert violence on, on its opponents. And we have that from the beginning. And then you have the use of violence very early on against perceived regime opponents or people who might become the opponents. And so that includes, in the case, again, of all these countries, it often included people who had been fighting the Nazis. So contrary to what you would think, the, they, they, they focused on, you know, the, the people who'd been the armed opposition to Hitler were often their first, the, the people who they first identified as potential enemies. Because basically, if you're organized enough and clever enough to fight Hitler, then you can do it, you can fight the, us too. And so that was, that was, that was building block number one. Building block number two was the radio. Um, not newspapers, not intellectual magazines. They often let that go until a little bit later. The radio, because it was the tool of mass propaganda. And they thought, the radio will reach the people who are going to support us. And this, again, tells you something about the, so, you know, the ideologists of the Soviet Union thought they would have, people would support them, and they believed in the power of their own ideology. We can convince people. You know, if we just get enough people to listen to our radio programs, then they will be on our side. And you can see this, actually. I had a wonderful time reading the archives of the East German radio, um, the sort of administration of the East German radio in the late 40s and 50s, where they talk about this power of ideology. And, and they get very distressed because they know that sometimes they're boring, and they're worried they're boring. And they say, you know, they, comrade, you know, we, you know if, we, if we put out comrade Honecker's speeches for three hours, nobody's going to listen to us. So what else can we do to grip the people and convince them? And then somebody else says, well, maybe we could cut Honecker's speech and we could make it shorter. And then someone else says, no, we can't do that because the people must learn the ideology. And there was always an argument about what's the best way to reach people. But the radio stations, they take everywhere they go. I mean, in Berlin, before the end of the war, they've taken over the, East, the, the, radio station of, uh, the main radio station of the Nazi Germany. And within a few days of the war's end, they're already broadcasting. In Poland, they set up the new Polish radio station themselves. In Hungary, they make sure that the Hungarian Communist parties control the radio station. So even before, even, even in a period when there's still other parties, the communists are in control of the radio um, everywhere they go. The third piece of it, and this was, um, this is maybe even more unexpected. The other thing they're interested in from the beginning, from the moment they arrive, is institutions of what we now call civil society um, in the more, that's how you fashionable term for it. But to them it was 
associations, church groups, youth groups, particularly youth groups, um, any, any form of, you know, any part of sort of self-organized elements in society. And so in East Berlin, this took the form where there were these young people who right after the war ended started forming these kind of enthusiastic youth brigades to help rebuild the city. And that, that bothered both the German communists and the, and the Soviet occupiers. They said, we can't have these independent youth groups. We can only have organized youth groups. So everybody has to organize and sign up with the state and get permission to be a group in order to, you know, so the idea was to suppress anything spontaneous and make sure that all efforts to organize come from the state or attached to the state. And so that applied to the Polish Boy Scouts. It applied to the, a whole group, a group of Hungarian youth groups were outlawed um, in 1946. And this is, again, a concern of theirs from the beginning. Where is the energy of society come from? And this actually is a very old, this goes back to the Russian Revolution. This was an obsession of Lenin's was, um, you know, they, they had different names, you know, factions within the society or, you know, and in, independent groups were, were something they wanted to destroy from the beginning. This also they do everywhere, even in countries where it takes them longer to take political power. They try and take control of the social sphere even before that. And the fourth element, and this does vary from country to country because it doesn't apply everywhere, is ethnic cleansing <coughs> um, to do these, these, these mass movements of people out of Germans out of Poland, Poles out of Ukraine, Germans out of Czechoslovakia. And that's also a piece of bringing in Soviet power. That's, that's, that one's not quite so universal. Mm -hmm. This determination to take civil society and replace it with something else, mm. And that brings us on to one very vexed issue which you address in the introduction, the question of totalitarianism, and to what extent this label, which some Sovietologists claimed at the time, was ideologically charged uh, and partial, and to what extent totalitarianism was an accurate designation of Stalinism and its successes. There were, I remember there were many Soviet scholars uh, sorry, scholars of the Soviet Union in the 1970s and 1980s mm. who would claim that um, these societies were far more pluralist than the Cold War form of historian would give credit for. And what you're describing is something quite different. It's um, the removal of politics from the state altogether. Well, the, they were always more pluralist, and this actually harks back to a point you made in your previous question that I didn't quite answer, um, which is that the, the, the Soviet Union and its you know, satellite states in East Europe had totalitarian intentions. So yes, they intended for society to cease to be pluralist. There would be not only would there be no opposition political parties, there would be no social movements or organizations or chess clubs or soccer teams that were not somehow under the umbrella of the state and were not somehow state controlled. That was their intention and their that's what they wanted. And they wanted all schools to be teaching the same curriculum, and they wanted a kind of unity of propaganda to apply across the society and all forms of media and so on. They never succeeded in doing this. I mean, even actually in you know, the very height of Stalinism in 51 or 52, they never actually made it. They didn't achieve this complete totalitarianism. Um, and it was actually the moments when violence appears in these societies, particularly in the late 40s and early 50s, when they begin mass arrests again, they begin waves of terror, it's usually because of the frustration of the communists. They're trying to achieve this total control. <clears throat> their ideology, their Marxist literature tells them they can achieve it, um, and not only that, that people are going to want them to achieve it, and that they are going to be popular once they've achieved it, but somehow it never works. It hasn't worked, it, you know, it doesn't succeed, and so what's the explanation? Well, the explanation is they're spies, you know, or they're saboteurs, or there's, you know, uh, there's a group of people who are secretly sponsored by the Americans who are trying to overthrow our society. There always has to be some explanation as to why the system, which is, after all, Marxism is a science, why it hasn't worked out. There has to be an explanation as to why, um, uh, uh, as to why it hasn't worked out, and so, they, and so the system erupts in violence. I want to come on to this question of searching for spies mm -hmm. as an explanation for the economic failures of the bloc. But let me just still, uh, let's just address this question of totalitarianism and its failure. And you cite in the book Hannah Arendt and her great book, The Origins of Totalitarianism, and you note quite correctly that totalitarianism, attempted totalitarianism, was much less permanent than 
I mean, nobody, nobody ever, I mean, I don't want to say ever, because who knows, but you know, it, it's, it's, it's never, it has never be, yet been possible to achieve and maintain over any period of time. Mm -hmm. it, it fragments, and it requires, because of course the idea of totalitarianism is not that it, there will be violence and you'll have to arrest lots of people in order to make them go along with the, with the, with the ideas. The, the idea is that everybody will be convinced, they will be re-educated, they will become homo sovieticus, they will, they will, they will automatically agree, and they, there will be no opposition in the society. But it doesn't happen, and so they have to use violence to make it happen, and that's really, I can't think of an exception to that rule. Mm -hmm. Let's go on to the question of this search for spies. And mm -hmm. um, it goes back to my original question about the show trials and the wildly implausible confessions that uh, very senior figures in the National Communist Parties um, made um, for reasons that I found a particularly fascinating exposition of, of, of the, in your book about the... Um, the psychological disconnect in the population, hearing these uh, well-known figures confess to crimes that they could not possibly have committed, wondering if they were true or wondering what basis society could have if they weren't true. People found but, it very confusing. Yeah. Um, there's one name that, um, uh, that, that stuck out for me in your, in your exposition, precisely because almost nobody here will have heard of him, Noel Field. Um, when I was reading that section of the, the second half of your book on um, high Stalinism, um, I was thinking, of course, of 1984 and Darkness at Noon, Arthur Kistler's great novel of, um, uh, of Stalinist repression. And the Emmanuel Goldstein figure came to me with this unassuming, completely unknown figure, Noel Field, who I hadn't realized was quite so prominent in the accusations against party figures. Tell us about that. I'm particularly proud of resurrecting Noel Field, actually, and very few people have noticed it, so thank you. <laughs> Noel Field was an American, um, sort of very left-wing. In fact, he was a member of the Communist, secret member of the Communist Party. Uh, American who was working in Europe for, um, uh, I think it was the Unitar of a relief group during the war, who became somewhat entangled with the various communists. He was living in Switzerland. The various communists who were traveling around Europe at that time, Hungarian communists, Czech communists, you know, who, who met him from his neutral spot in Switzerland and who, who got to know him. Um, and after the war, he went back to the United States and didn't have much to do and I think actually was looking for employment. And he realized that lots of his friends, who he people he'd met during the war and been <coughs> sympathetic with and drunk vodka with or whatever you drink in Switzerland, um, ha, ha, were, were back in power. Many people he knew were now in the Czech Communist Party or the Hungarian Communist Party. And so he decided to go back. And I think basically his, his intention was to go job hunting. He went to, um, he flew back to the region and he was, he flew back to Hungary where he was arrested. And he, he, this happened at a particularly opportune moment, um, which is that he was arrested at a moment when uh, the, the, the East European regimes were looking for scapegoat. And they were looking for, you know, they, they were looking for an explanation for what was going wrong in their society. And they were looking for a, um, a reason why things were working, weren't working. And they lit upon Noel Field as the person who had connections to many odd people across the block. He was a sort of person who knew many other people. And they they started a whole series of investigations. And essentially what happened, I mean, I'm making the long story short, anybody who knew Noel Field or who had once ever met Noel Field was <laughs> suddenly liable to arrest. It was particularly true in Prague, Budapest, but also Warsaw, and actually also East Germany, East Berlin. Um, and he became the sort of central figure in a vast invented conspiracy um, and with which he had nothing to do with. And he was in jail uh, for many years. Eventually, many years later, he was pardoned, and he actually wrote um, he wrote a sort of description of his life, which was in the Hungarian archives, which was found uh, by a friend of mine. And he uh, actually, after this whole long experience of being in prison, decided to stay in communist Hungary. He never left again. But he's a, he's a sort of, you're right, he's a kind of cipher. I mean, he's not, neither a very interesting <coughs> nor compelling person, but who was a... 
who became the focus for a very elaborate invented conspiracy based on the fact that lots of different kinds of people knew him. Maybe I should let people come in and out. Where are they coming? Anyway. Anyway, let's, Back let's, to Noel Field. let's continue. Yeah. I, I, I raise Noel Field precisely because he is anonymous, mm. uh, unassuming. Everyone knows of the allegations against Trotsky in the Moscow show trials. Virtually nobody here, including me, will have known that Noel Field, this sometimes State Quaker, Department actually, official, yeah. sometimes State Department official, was designated by the secret police in various of these countries as the prime figure in a in a in a He, in a he was in his day people had heard of him. I mean he became mm. a in the sort of sixties. You yeah. know, Arthur Kessler would have heard mm. of him. I mean he was a he became he was fairly notorious. But but no, you're right, in in the last fifty years no not fifty years, forty years, nobody's talked about him very nobody's much. Nobody's talked about him. He did I don't want to go on about this <laughs> unassuming figure, but um, <laughs> one interesting story about him is he was so useless as a spy that Al Jahis who some people bizarrely think was innocent. Uh, who no, no, he was a friend himself. of Alger Hiss. Uh, he was a friend of Alger Hiss. Alger Hiss tried to recruit him to Soviet intelligence, and he was already working for Soviet intelligence and revealed this fact, yeah. which, yeah. which he sh should never have done. Um, let's, go, let's go back to the... the yes, the, I should the, add one other yes, thing about please. it, which is he's evidence for why you, sh if Soviet intelligence or Russian or any ever ask you to work for them, Say no, because uh, he because he was in a, he was he was a secret, very rather clumsy, but a sort of secret ally of the Soviet intelligence that made him suspicious to Soviet intelligence. Mm -hmm. I mean, they knew he was a double agent, so they arrested him anyway. Yes, one other point about Noel Once he had been <laughs> released from prison in Hungary, like all good communists, he confessed his sins yep. and was grateful for the opportunity to do so. And he yep. died in Anybody 1970 Budapest. in Budapest. Yep. Um, the fate of the peoples of the satellite states, uh, as I say, much of the second half of your book is, t is, is, is devoted to the repression of civil society, <laughs> the fruitless attempts to create uh, Homo Sovieticus, and the... Um, uh, the quandary that public figures in the satellite states and the general population had in how to respond. Um, you discuss two very different ways of responding in the Catholic Church, which was ruthlessly suppressed in the, in the satellite states. Tell us, tell us about that and the different decisions that these respective church leaders came to. Yes, one of the conclusions I came to, I, I developed while writing this book, this book a lot of sympathy for people who lived in that period. You know, this was a period of time in which you really had no good choices. You couldn't just decide to be a freedom fighter and stand up for democracy. I mean, you could, but then A, you would be arrested, B, your wife would be arrested, C, your child would get kicked out of college, D, your mother would be thrown out of the hospital. Because the state controlled so many aspects of society, people had really very bad and, and, and hard decisions to make. And so I developed sympathy for that. And I particularly developed sympathy for people in the church um, who were in some, during this period, were under the most pressure of all. And I, I tried to personalize this a little bit in the book by comparing two very famous church figures. One is Cardinal Mincenti in Hungary, and the other is Cardinal Vyshinsky in Poland. They were the respective heads of the church in those, the Catholic church, uh, in those two countries. And they both responded very differently to Soviet pressure, but both, I thought, out of the same you know, moral motives and good intentions. And namely, Mincenti was a very obstinate opponent, and he always said what he thought. And he, when the, when the Communist Party closed the monasteries and shut down church schools and church hospitals, which they did, this was part of the shutting down of independent institutions, he protested, and he wrote letters, and he called up the Vatican, and he tried to get publicity in the West. Um, and he was treated unbelievably brutally eventually by the state. He was beaten, he was imprisoned, he was made to go through his own show trial, um, and eventually he was, um, you know, he, he was then under house arrest for many years, and there's a longer saga, some of you will know, which is that during 1956 revolution he emerged only to have to go back into hiding, and then he spent actually, now I've forgotten how many years it is, but at least a decade living in the American embassy in Budapest. That's what happened, that was his fate. Cardinal Vyshinsky, equally moral, equally devoted, you know, um, 
uh, deeply um, you know, eminent church figure had a different reaction, which is that he tried to cooperate. Um, and you could, if you were being nasty, you could say collaborate, but that's, I think, very unfair in this context. So he signed a deal with the kind of church-state agreement, and he tried to find ways to work with the system. And his motivation, as he wrote about it at the time and afterwards, was, look, we'd just been through this terrible war in which Polish, the Polish Catholic Church was a target of Hitler as well. Uh, many, many Polish priests were killed during the Second World War. Many died in concentration camps. I needed to protect the church and protect the people inside the church so that some piece of it continued. And so he, as I say, he cooperated. He allowed the, he allowed the state to be involved in all kinds of church decisions and so on. I mean, he, he was also badly treated. He was also eventually arrested. He was, it was not quite as brutal. I mean, he was not beaten and he was not put on trial. And he was eventually also released, also in 56 when Poland had its kind of revolution as well. There was a moment of post-Stalin thaw. Uh, and, and I compare the, the two, again, not to say that one path was better and the other path was worse, but just to show that working out of the same motivations, people could come to a very different conclusion about tactics. Mm -hmm. And you can see this throughout the society. You know, there are many stories like this in the book. Uh, there's one, one of my favorite ones is of a, a Polish woman who was very interested in the decorative arts, and it's a long story, but she uh, decided in 1945 to collaborate with the communist regime and to join the culture ministry because she saw it as a, she wanted to promote Polish artists. She was very interested in what we would call the arts and crafts movement, sort of Polish uh, uh, peasant crafts, wanting to make them modern, <coughs> join, the, you know, uh, sell peasant ideas to, the, to, to factories. Uh, and she thought that through collaborating with the government, she could make this happen, and she could do some good for Polish artists and for folk artists. And the, actually, she failed. Uh, she was not at all nicely remembered by the Polish arts community, who remembered her as an old Stalinist. Not very interesting. But if you go back and look at her motivations at the time, you begin to have some sympathy for her and what she was trying to do. And I found that not with everybody. There were certainly some bad guys in this period, and quite a lot of them. But there were many people who thought, this is the country I live in. I don't want to leave. I need to find some way to exist here. I don't, you know, I need to protect my family. I need to find some way to get along inside the regime. And people made all kinds of choices that some of them look bad to us now, but once you put yourself back into their mentality, you become more sympathetic. And nobody knew that communism was impermanent. Uh, nobody, it certainly even, did not look like it was coming to an end anytime soon, particularly after 1956, but even before that. And in, um, in the anti-communist literature in the West, Whitaker Chambers, among others, thought that he was on the losing side, that yep. he had to come out from, uh, Whitaker Chambers, former communist spy, had to come out from that, uh, that background and, and, and agitate against communism. But I, I got from your book um, a much greater sense of the moral, the complexity of the moral compromises that... Um, that prominent figures and not so prominent figures in Eastern and Central Europe had to uh, had to make. Yeah, absolutely. It's very important to remember, and it, this is actually true of when you look back at Kessler or his argument with Sartre, or when you look back at the intellectual disputes of that time. Mm -hmm. When you look at the 1947 or 1951, it did not look like communism was about to end. On the contrary, it was gathering strength. The French Communist Party was very powerful. The Italian Communist Party was very powerful. There was no reason to think the system was going to end. On the contrary, it looked like it was gaining ground. And, and that, you know, to the, from the perspective of that moment, you know, it's always important when you look back at history not to see it based on what we know now. Yeah. You know, now we know it was doomed and it was never going to succeed and so on. But at that time, people didn't know that. One very small example um, of a figure, a cultural figure, um, whose reputation has fluctuated. You refer to Christa Wolf, the um, East German novelist, who has her admirers, Anne McElvoy, who knows a great deal about Germany, um, is a great evangelist for her work. And to me, Christoph Wolf was so tied up with the former East German regime mm. um, that her reputation can never recover. This is funny. I actually have people, I have less sympathy for people who collaborated in the 70s and 80s because <coughs> East Germany, again, a little different. But by that time, you began to have more choices, mm. you know, in... Many of these countries, you didn't, you no longer had to be a propagandist for the regime in order to live your life and 
and, and so on. And so that, that it, it, be, it, became, it became more possible to um, not to collaborate later on. And I think Krista Wolf, I, mean, I have a different problem with Krista Wolf, which is that I can't stand her writing, but that's mm. another. I find her novels unreadable. But yeah, that's, me too. That's yeah. a separate, that's separate totally question. unconnected. Maybe it's connected, but it's not. Um, let me turn to the critical reaction to your book, which has been almost uniformly, <laughs> almost uniformly enthusiastic. There was one exception, um, a review, I think, in the New York Times, where the reviewer of, I think, a former Moscow correspondent for the Times. 85-year-old Moscow correspondent. Uh, yeah. <laughs> former Moscow correspondent, elderly Moscow correspondent. He was correspondent. in Moscow in the 60s. Okay. Yeah. When, when I say the Times, the New York Times. New York I, Times. I, I no, God forbid, not the London Times. Um, he said, and I paraphrase, oh, Anne Applebaum's raking it up all again. We know all this. And um, let me turn to one point in your book where you're talking about the system of prison camps in Eastern Europe, modelled on the Gulag. Mm. And you refer to a visit you made to one in Hungary, a short-lived prison in Hungary. Uh -huh. Exactly. Um, that you say was, was only in existence for maybe three years mm. And there's nothing of it left apart from maybe a few stone farmhouses and a lot of mud. And when I read that section of your book, I thought the, great, the greatest atrocities of the 20th century are commemorated in the physical infrastructure being maintained at Auschwitz. Mm. But there isn't such a thing, or is there, in the Gulag and the way it was replicated in Eastern and Central Europe. So this reviewer has got it exactly wrong. You're, yeah. you're referring to things that, that, that need to be remembered and are not well understood. Yeah, I th his objection was also to all these boring old stories. Do we need to know all these facts? Which it was a strange way. I mean, you know, if, you, if, if you're going to review a history book, then you should at least begin with mm. some interest in history. <laughs> <laughs> You know, it, if, uh, it, as I say, it bothered me at the time, but uh, let's say I've got over it. Um, I mean, th this is a bigger question about memory of this period, and there are sort of two separate strands in your question. One is maybe to do with the gulag and the camps, mm. and the other is the Stalinist period. And um, although actually the answer is similar, I mean, it, ni neither is well or intelligently remembered anywhere. Um, the Gulag in the Soviet Union, that's a very long story that I've written and spoken about uh, quite a lot, um, has, has not ever been, prop neither has it been properly commemorated in, in the sense of bricks and mortar and museums, nor has it ever been properly taught to Russians um, who, as a result, don't have a, I think there's a gap in their understanding of their own history, how things got to be they, the way they are, why is Russia... Uh, the way it is. Somebody recently put it to me like this, that the present is only the sum of decisions taken in the past. So if you want to know why do things look the way they are, well, that's because of um, things that people did 10 and 20 and 30 years ago. And if you don't understand those things, then it's ha hard to understand the present. Um, and I think that's, it's a particularly acute problem in Russia because, I mean, it's, it's not just the blog, it's the history of the system, which isn't taught and isn't um, commemorated, and when it is done, it's often very partial. And um, the problem, the, the Stalinist period in Eastern Europe is interesting because actually the Eastern Europeans do care more about commemorating and remembering. Um, but this particular moment, the exact post-war moment, is not one that anybody likes to talk about. I mean, the Poles will talk about 1980, then the Solidarity Movement. Uh, the Hungarians will talk about 1956. This is a particularly unpleasant and difficult moment. And I often found in interviews with people that this was reflected in that. So I would go and see somebody, and, and, what, and an older man, I went to have a recollection of interviewing somebody who'd been, I wanted to talk to him because he'd been a teacher in this period in a school, and I wanted to talk about education. And he, what he wanted to talk about was the war, the Second World War, and how he'd been part of this underground university that taught illegally. And it was a kind of heroic um, thing that he'd done. And then he was also interested in talking about after Stalin's death and after what we call the thaw in this region, how he'd been part of this renovation of education and so on. I said, no, 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 that's not what my book is about. I want to talk about this in-between period, you know, what happened after the war. And he said, oh, after the war, it wasn't very interesting. Um, and it, was, it, it sounds funny, but it, people felt very ambivalent about this time because – 
The war had ended. Many of them had been heroic during the war. But then after the post-war period was not heroic. And, and with some really extraordinary and important exceptions, people found it difficult to behave in a way that they remembered with great pleasure. And you know, I did this admirable thing. Um, and you know, even people who, you know, for example, the Polish armed resistance in that period, I met some people who'd been part of that. And they said, well, what was the, you know, there was a sense that it wasn't, it was pointless. You know, why, why were you fighting the Red Army with a shotgun in the woods in 1947? There was, you know, you were going to lose. And so nobody has this feeling about that period of having done something heroic or great. And that makes it a, it's a very complicated historical period to talk about even now. Um, even in a region that does, uh, you know, the, that does try to commemorate the past and does, and does talk about crimes and, 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 this, this moment, which is not the bloodiest moment in that region's history, um, although it, it's not a nice moment either, but, and it's, and it, and it, but it's, also, it's also one that, as, we, as you pointed out correctly, is morally complicated. And so it doesn't, people still find it very difficult to speak about. Ultimately, containment worked. Um, it was a doctrine devised in extreme circumstances um, with a, with a dual aim of, of avoiding a large-scale conflict. Do you think, I, I was struck listening to parliamentary exchanges this afternoon um, about um, uh, confronting um, Islamist terrorism. The Prime Minister said, um, I paraphrase, and I may have got his words slightly wrong anyway, um, we're not going to contain it, we're going to prevail. Do you think there are lessons in the experience of Eastern Europe and the Soviet Union and Western containment of it that can be read off today? Um, there, are, there are lessons, but they aren't, they aren't going to come in the form that you want them to come. You know, like containment worked in Germany, so it will work in Mali. Um, you know, there, there are lessons about dealing with people who have extreme beliefs. Uh, you know, but I mean, I, you know, you don't want me to go, th there, but there are many differences in the situation. So the, you know, what, you know, in Eastern Europe, we were talking about a nuclear power. Um, here we're talking about, and, and we were talking about an organized army, you know, an organized system that we were fighting. Um, in, in North Africa, we're talking about some, I mean, even, even a place like Libya has some fundamentally healthy elements, and I mean, healthy is maybe a bad word, but um, f f elements, there are parts of society that are very friendly to us and positive, and then there are these other groups that aren't. So I'm not sure that talking about containment in the same context um, is quite the right expression. Um, there are lessons about fanaticism and about how fanatics think. Um, you can make parallels between the way you know, pe people who are motivated by by that kind of ideology are capable of doing things, and are you know and they don't question themselves. Um, they behave and they they behave according to you know a set of rules that they've come to believe are true. And you can draw parallels like that. I don't know that you can draw lessons about how to deal with them in the same way. Okay. Sorry if that's not entirely satisfying answer. That's a very good answer. Um, ladies and gentlemen, let me, let me see if there are any questions from you. Yes, please. There's, oh, one here and a lady here. Um, Steve Crawford, congratulations on our... Hi, Steve. <laughs> my ex-boss. <laughs> <laughs> congratulations on a fascinating um, book. Um, obviously, a lot of the narrative, by definition, is very, very different from any of the official communist narratives of that period. But what I found grippingly fascinating was how incredibly different, and you hinted at it a moment just now, many of the bits, the ethnic cleansing chapter was, was one, but actually many different bits, which were really different from the local accepted narratives that people were, felt comfortable with. I wonder if you personally, when writing the book, perhaps before but, or during writing the book, were there particular bits that really surprised you, thinking, oh my God, I really hadn't realized things were like this, rather than what I'd thought for many years were that? Were there particular either overall things or particular elements that surprised you during the research, or, or did it merely fill out what you were already seeing before? 
I would say a lot of it was surprising, part, partly because Steve and I both worked at The Independent in the late 1980s and early 1990s and were covering the, he in a senior position and me in a very junior position were covering the collapse of communism. And so we, what we saw in that period was, you know, something that had evolved over 30 years and was already fraying at the edges and so on. And I had never, until starting to work on this book, I had never thought about how it got there in the first place. I mean, we, you know, we were, we watched, you know, we met dissidents and we, we knew it was all a sham and it was, that the ideology wasn't working. And I found that trying to think back into what would have been appealing about it in 1945 and why it would have been successful was all rather surprising, given that nobody I knew, no poll I met, in fact, I think no poll that I've ever met was a communist. I mean, that, that nobody would, there, you could not find a, a Marxist in Poland in 1989. There were no, nobody in the Communist Party, nobody outside the Communist Party. There was, it was a very hard thing to find. My husband, who's Polish, once said that the first Marxist he ever met, he grew up in Poland, was at Balliol College, Oxford. I mean, <laughs> I mean, there were no Marxists in Poland. And so trying to figure out who it was and why people would have found it appealing, that was all very eye-opening. And maybe that, that's, that's your point, because you know, if you'd been walking around Eastern Europe in 89 and 90 like we were, um, you didn't... You know, you, you didn't meet anybody who believed in it, so you might have tended to assume that nobody had ever believed it. Well, actually, they did. And if you go back and read the literature from 45, from 50, you see that people did believe it, or anyway, they spoke as if they believed it, so they were motivated. And that, I think, is the surprising bit. You know, how did, you know, the, you, the other thing you get in these countries is people will say, well, it was the Russians' fault, which it was, okay. Um, or it was somebody else's fault, or it's because the West didn't help us. And that's all absolutely true, and there are elements of, of, of correctness to that. But there was also, people did also go along with it, either because they believed it, or because they felt they had to believe it, or because it was convenient to believe it, or because they wanted to go back and live their lives and go back to school, or, you know, and get a job. And f discovering that piece of it was, for me, surprising, because I'd never met anybody who had any faith in the system before you know, from people my generation in, in, the, in that part of the world. So yes, that was surprising. Okay. Madam. All right. Um, I'm a great admirer of Gulag and your earlier work on, um, on your journey through Eastern Europe. From what you said, I'm very fascinated in the role played by these sort of forgotten minorities, both as apparatuses of the state, like the fact that Stalin, I believe, recruited a lot of minorities to do that secret police work and in the mythology of Poles I knew when I was much younger whose parents said ah oh, the Jews ran the communist party and the whole significance and I don't I still don't know what its real significance was of the Soviet Jewry movement in starting to create some sort of crumbling of that apparatus, and I don't know how significant it was, whether we in the West think it was significant, but in terms of what you're saying, it sounds as if it may have been significant, and I'm just interested in how those two different things, these minorities who could be at one time held responsible for doing the dirty work, but also became the centers of opposition. I'm wondering so It's like the, the Jews are the, both the communists and the capitalists, you know, which? You know, the, yeah. <laughs> to decide. Um, are they Bolsheviks trying to undermine the state or are they capitalists controlling everything? Um, Stalin, Stalin was obsessed with minorities and with nationality politics um, and in retrospect was very good at it and he often sought you know, as an occupier to play different national groups off one another and he did that inside the Soviet Union all the time. Uh, but he also did it to the extent that he could in Eastern Europe. Um, and the, 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 I have to be careful with the role of the Jews because it's extremely different in different countries. So there actually were no Jews in Germany after the war, so they're not even in the equation. Um, in Poland, they had, uh, the, there, were, there were a number of Jews in the secret police in the early days. 
but there weren't any later on in any way. The bulk of the secret police were never Jewish, and so that was a kind of, that was a mythology. In Hungary, a lot of the Hungarian party, Communist Party was Jewish, so it, it's a, it, it plays a little bit differently depending on the national context. Um, but yes, Stalin did try to use minority politics to play people off one another. He tried to make people opposed to one another so that they would, you know, it was kind of divide and rule tactics. Um, you know, now you, I mean, if I think I understood your question was, did the, you know, did these Jewish groups then help unravel the system later on? Um, again, that's going to depend on on the country. Did the Jewish movement in the Soviet Union um, help bring down the Soviet Union? That that's a more complicated question about to what role did any dissident groups help help bring it down? It's certainly true that the Jews had a special role inside the Soviet Union because they had sympathy outside from the early days. I mean, they had, a, they had an alternate um, constituency to whom they could appeal, whether it was American Jews or, or European Jews. And so that gave them a kind of leverage inside the system that other people didn't have, um, at least not in those days. Later on, there were Ukrainian groups who, from Canada and so on who got involved. Um, but you'd, ha you'd have to break it down. I mean, to, to answer your question, I would say yes, the the minority politics played were important, and in the book I try and explain some of this. There's a chapter on the role of the on the on the minorities and the role of the Jews um, in this period. But I couldn't give you a general answer. It, it's 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 specific to different countries and different places at times, depending on the proportion of the population. Okay. Yes, uh, one, two, three, four. I wanted to ask if uh, studying this period gave you a heightened appreciation for the fragility of freedom in society. And if it maybe makes you look at societies today uh, and maybe see that fragility in a way that you sense is not captured by most of the people around you. And if so, uh, is there anything that you see as particularly threatening to the freedom that we have today? Um, well, that's an easy question. I mean, the, the, the answer is yes, in that what's very sobering when you read the, this history is to realize that some of the institutions that were destroyed first by the war and then by the post-war attack on them were very, very ancient and old institutions. If you're talking about the Polish Catholic Church or the Hungarian Catholic Church or um, great universities or monasteries or um, even something like the scouting movement, which had you know strength behind it and numbers and, and, and a good organization. And you see the speed with which they could be destroyed by somebody who wanted to destroy them. Um, then, yes, you do worry about the fragility of, of, of freedom and of, of societies that respect the rule of law. It's not difficult to... You know, with, if, if you're single-minded about it and you want to undermine even very old and very popular and very established institutions, you can do it. Um, it's complicated, again, I, I mean, it's like the question uh, Oliver asked me about containment. To tr to, you know, I believe that the present is the sum of the past, but I don't necessarily believe that there are direct lessons from the past for the present, that it works in that, in that direct way. Uh, there is certainly a there's certainly an argument you can make about the importance of um, protecting and preserving institutions and institutional structures that uh, you know n not not allowing associations to be undermined, not letting you know judicial systems to be corrupted. Um, uh, you know wh whether that applies to the West. Right now, it's hard. I don't. I mean, we we're not in a position right now in in Western societies where we have uh, a, a single-minded uh, occu occupier who is trying to undermine and destroy our society. So, if the question is, you know, are we too in danger of becoming Soviet totalitarian societies? And the answer is no. Um, if if the question is, do we need to be constantly on the alert and prepared for? Uh, the erosion of our legal system and the erosion of our freedoms of speech and our freedoms of association and should we talk about this a lot then the answer is yes and should should i mean what d democracies are never perfect and there's always a um, and there's always an up and down 
you know, there's a period when there's a lot of civil liberties, and then there's a drop in civil liberties, and then there's, you know, the, you can trace American history all through the 20th century like that. It kind of comes and goes in phases. Um, and the important thing, it seems to me, and this is true of America and of Britain, is to keep up the conversation, you know, that enough people understand what are these fundamental building blocks of freedom, how do we make sure that they, they continue to be supported. That, you know, democracies have to be continually and constantly reformed. You know, they don't, they're not static systems. Um, I hope that's what you wanted. Okay. A, a lady at the end there. Uh, thank you. Um, uh, I read your book and I really enjoyed it. And I have a question. Um, you use the phrase political correctness in your book in the context of censorship and uh, repression in Hungary and Poland. And that touched a nerve with me um, because I'm curating an art show, Passion for Freedom. And recently I was touched by a case of Iranian Dutch artist that was taken to court for hate speech where she was actually doing an artwork. So would you like to comment on that? I'll ask these easy questions. Um, I mean, I think I use the phrase political correctness as a shortcut, you know, implying, you know, there's a range of things that you're allowed to say and, and, and not allowed to say. And of course, that would be different in, in different societies. Um, you know, the, 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 the specifics of a communist society were, you know, that po political correctness, meaning what you were and weren't allowed to say, was enforced by violence and by arrests and by, uh, and there was no argument about it. In, in, in our societies, the difference is that you can have an argument about it. And we, we do make mistakes and we do arrest people for, uh, you know, wrongly or anyway, debatably or doubtfully for, for things um, uh, maybe they shouldn't be arrested for, but the, the one advantage our society has over an authoritarian or a totalitarian society is that we can then argue about it and people like you can do an art exhibition about it and the person arrested can get a lawyer and can challenge the, and can challenge the state. So I don't think we have and we never will have a kind of perfect, perfectly defendable and um, static system of civil liberties that will always work for every situation and every exception. Um, but the one advantage we have is the ability to change it you know, in, a, in a way that people accept as legitimate. The gentleman here. You spoke a number of times about the difference between the different countries behind the Iron Curtain. Um, I traveled a little bit in Poland at the end of the 70s before Jaruzelski, and in Hungary in the uh, 1980s, and was very much aware of the differences in reactions between the different countries and the different cultures. And I wonder if you, um, you've talked very generally about the legacy of Stalinism. And your book stops at 56. I'm interested to know whether there's going to be a follow-up after 56, because all oh, the, the, yeah. well, <laughs> somebody's got to do it. Um, I, I'm interested to know where you think the different countries that were occupied by the Russians after 45 started to diverge from each other in the ways in which they reacted to the imposition of totalitarian communism? Well, the, I mean, the answer to that is they were, as, as I've said six times, they were always different and they were, from the outside to an uneducated foreigner, they might have all looked the same, but in fact, they were always different. I think they're, certainly after Stalin died, you know, in 1953, uh, and the, the communist parties, the, the, the level of fear went down. And the Communist Party's willingness to use violence also went down. And their, in fact, their sense of their own security and their own longevity was diminished after Stalin died. And they were less willing to enforce their power through violence, although some of them went on doing it. Um, then you do begin to get all kinds of national divergences. And the paths actually that they take after 56 are very different. I mean, you can look at 56 in Poland and 56 in Hungary have different conclusions. The Hungarians had an armed rebellion. It was put down with Soviet tanks and, and violence. The Poles had a series of demonstrations and they wound up with a supposedly more reformist communist party in power. Um, in fact, it turned out that it was just a weaker communist party. It wasn't particularly reformist in the end. Um, so. So events take their course in different ways according to, to what's happened. I, people have tried and they often to, to attach 
uh, you know, East Germany developed in such and such a way because German national character is like X or Polish national character is like Y. And I'm always reluctant to do that um, because what we call national character does seem to change. Um, and it's changed in my lifetime. You know, so I remember, just to give you an example, in the early 90s, when Poland was becoming, had, had just ceased to be communist and was trying to reform itself, the number of articles written about Poland is a basket case, it can't possibly reform itself, it's never had any capitalism, it's never had a stable democracy, how can, it, how can we expect Poland to, and I, I could go and dig up some of these articles if you wanted me to. There was a particularly long one in the New York Review of Books, I remember. Uh, <laughs> And it turned out to be not true. I mean, it, it, it turned out the Poles could do capitalism and they could do, um, they could have a democracy. You know, what they needed was a different set of institutions and a different set of laws, some of which they borrowed from the European Union, some of which they discovered in their own past, um, some of which they, you know, they, 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 they got from their admiration of the United States. But in any ways, they, it, it turned out they could make it into a different country. And so now we, so has the Polish national character changed or have Polish political institutions changed and has the Polish elite changed? Uh, and, and I think you can see, you can make the same argument about, about um, the rest of Eastern Europe. Well, I was thinking about one particular field, the one that I was my, involved in myself, cultural field, that the reaction of the Poles and the reaction of the Czechs, for instance, to the totalitarian uh, imposition was totally different. Um, the Poles are, in that brief thaw period before Jaruzelski, actually had an immensely diverse and actually quite radical theater, literature, and so on. They did. Whereas the Czechs, who traditionally have this sort of Schweikian way of reacting to things, you know, um, ag 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 acknowledgement and indifference, um, ha had a period of, after 68, after the, the R Russians tank tanks came in, they had a period of almost total cultural stasis. Well, the Havel's plays, the plastic people of the universe, do you uh, remember that rock it, band? Oh, well, absolutely, but these <laughs> were... The, but, 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 the great Czech rock band <coughs> but this was this was mu this was this was much later i mean this was a, the, the, the 70s yes this was in the 70s what interests me is is what caused and the hungarians the goulash communism and uh, which was established in, in in hungary the hungarians again managed to have all kinds of diversity which were, were which wasn't possible in other countries and yet they were all communist regimes they were all communist regimes i mean i i, I would y in each case, it's to do with the way, you know, the, the, the traditions of the country, the institutions that existed. Um, yes, the Czechs had a tradition, had a, had a national memory of living successfully under an empire and managing to preserve their culture anyway. And so they could draw on those traditions and those memories to, 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 to exist in the Soviet Union. On the other hand, they produced the greatest theorist of anti-communist opposition, which is Havel. So you don't want to be you want to be careful about making generalizations about them. I mean the same is true of the Poles. They they also they had this tradition of armed resistance. They had a tradition of you know they lived all through the 19th century also under empires and periodic rebellions and they, there was a long tradition of national resistance that they could draw on um, in order to to organize themselves too. But you know there were plenty of Polish collaborators and there was General Jaruzelski and there were, you know, there was a pretty, there was a, even in 1989 there was still a Polish Communist Party and it had um, some pretty uh, unpleasant and um, not very patriotic members who were, you know, also were Polish. So you have to be careful about, about national generalizations. My, my feeling is that people tend to draw on what they know and what are their past experience with their own institutions and their own history. Um, and, and yes, each of these countries had a different set of national memories of, of how to behave under an occupation. They had different literary traditions. You know, Poland has a whole literary tradition associated with rebellion and resistance and Adam Mickiewicz and romantic poetry. Um, and the Czechs, as you say, had Schweik, you know, this story of a soldier, good soldier who, but remember, Schweik is always making jokes and undermining his bosses and teasing the Austrian guards and you know, he's not an he's not a believer you know he's not a you know m mindless collaborator he's a he's somebody who goes along with it because he has no choice and he's powerless but he has a you know he finds ways around the around the system so yes each country has its own literary and artistic and cultural memory of how to react in these circumstances 
Um, but I'm not sure that that means that uh, you know, Poles will always be like X or Hungarians will always be like Y because places do change and countries change. Gentleman here. Hi, oh, good evening. Um, Anne, um, I have a simple question, even a naive one. Um, I, I was very interested in, 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 uh, in your comments concerning the, the, uh, um, the repression and recruitment of, of civil society, Bob, um, and wonder if there's a, some, some kind of recrudescence of, of of that methodology in modern Russia, with with Putin uh, taxing and and force, forcing uh, NGOs, for example, or civil society organisations to to, to uh, register. Uh, yes, uh, this this I think is not an accident. Um, there is a direct line uh, between from Putin to Andropov. Uh, Yuri Andropov was the Soviet ambassador to Budapest in 1956, and later on he was the head of the KGB, and then later on briefly he was the general secretary of the Communist Party. Putin came of age in Andropov's KGB. And why do I mention him? Because Andropov was in Hungary in 1956, and he saw what happened when you let all these groups live again. Because the, with the, what 1956 was was the reinvigoration of civil society. And first it started out with academic discussion groups, basically, and poetry reading. And then it became, you know, then the university students started inviting workers from the factories to their meetings to discuss poetry. And then, you know, then, then it, it, it spread like that. And eventually the Hungarian army joined them and so on. It's, it's a longer story. But to Andropov, the lesson of, the, the lesson of 56 was you can't let this happen. You know, you cannot let these, you know, these little innocent sounding groups, you know, these little academic societies and these artists and so on, they're really dangerous because when you, when you let them go, it can all unravel and then you have an armed rebellion. I think, uh, first of all, th that, that, was, that was the explanation for the, the Soviet treatment of groups like that in the 1980s was unbelievably harsh. I mean, the, the kind of treatment that dissidents and artists sort of, uh, got in, 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 Soviet, in the Soviet Union in the early, first half of the 80s when Andropov was in power um, was as severe as almost as anything in Stalin's time and people were sent to camp. There was no mass arrests or random arrests as there were in Stalin's period. But, but, but opponents of the regime were extremely harshly treated. They went to modern, ver more updated versions of the gulag and so on. And this was because of Andropov's belief that you have to pay attention to these little groups. They do matter. Uh, I think Putin, and he's sort of said this in his memoirs and in other places, had a similar experience in East Germany in 1989. He was the KGB officer in Dresden in that period. And he watched exactly the same thing happen. You know, the society unravels, all these little groups who he thought weren't important, they join in big demonstrations, you know, they, they and what happens in both cases, the secret policemen are kicked out. In, in, in 56, they actually lynch some of them. In 89, they all lost their jobs. What's the conclusion? These small groups, and these NG, what, they take different names at different periods. Right now we're calling them NGOs. And sometimes we call them civil society. Sometimes they've been called other things. You know, but these groups of self-organized um, individuals, artists, writers, intellectuals, they must be controlled because they're very dangerous. And I think Putin has drawn exactly that conclusion. I mean, this is exactly what I was talking about. This is somebody who takes his own, what's his own life experience, his own memories. He remembers 89. He was taught by Andropov, who remembered 56. Um, they take their own life experience and they apply it to what they know. And you can see him, again, he's not a Soviet person. He's not trying to achieve totalitarianism in the same way that his predecessors were. Um, but he does care a lot, and it, sort of inexplicably, in fact, about Pussy Riot, you know, or the artists, or small groupuscules who, you know, paint avant-garde paintings. Why? Because he has this institutional memory of, of those kinds of people being very dangerous. And so, yes, I think that's exactly what he's doing. Uh, and it, in fact, if you look at what has, how has Putin tried to control Russia? It's very interesting. There are three institutions he thinks are incredibly important. One is control over civil society. One is control over the mass media, meaning in this case television. 
Uh, and the third is maintaining control over the secret police and using not mass violence, but targeted violence. So you don't kill all the journalists, but you kill Anna Politkovskaya. You know, so, and it, it's, it has not accidentally strikes me as being si very similar to tactics that were used in the 40s and 50s. But that's just a... Um, um, yes, yes, hello. Yes, please. Um, um, I, so I thought thematically this book was almost like a sequel to Gulag in that Gulag was about um, suppressing the Soviet's own people and this was about suppressing their neighbors. I'm wondering, um, you sort of slightly sidestepped this when the gentleman asked it earlier, whether there's, whether you attempt to do a trilogy of how it all fell apart and, well, I mean, I personally hope so, I'll, but I just wonder. Funny, funny you should ask. Um, yeah, I mean, I would love, I, it takes me a really long time to write a book and the thought of plunging in and doing another one, <laughs> you know, covering multiple countries who speak languages that I don't speak, uh, you know, and, is rather horrifying, but I would like to do it, yes. Uh, how it all fell apart is something I now find interesting. It's one of the interesting things, I, at the moment I am teaching for the first time, I'm spending years of visiting professor at the LSE, and my class has been, the first semester seminar has been on Soviet history, basically how totalitarianism was put together. So, and the second half is on how it all fell apart. And so for the first time I've been reading about 1989 by other historians and uh, you know, and having lived through it, I was there as a journalist at the time. I experienced it. I remember it. And I find reading it, suddenly, first of all, I'd never read any of the books about it. And now I've, I'm doing it for the first time. And I suddenly it all seems so implausible to me. I mean, how did it happen? You know, how can you explain it? And it, it, why did Gorbachev do what he did? Why did he just give up that enormous empire? For he, Nobody was making him do it. He didn't have to. It really, really, it could have gone on a lot longer. Uh, and when you when you think back about it, it makes instead of making more and more sense to me, it now makes less and less sense. Even though, even though as I said, I was there at the time and was writing about it as a journalist. There is a question at the back. If there is a lady in the audience who would like to ask the next question after that, could you make yourself known to Millicent, as, who has the uh, has the microphone? Oh, we'll have women's the microphone. rights, or yeah. <laughs> it's a man still. It, in describing the autocrats that ran, ran the satellite states. You referred to many, but not to three who were, seemed to have a fractious relationship, in Verhoja and Albania and Ceausescu and Tito. It, it, are they a different category and did, did they have an influence that contributed to the way the thing fell apart? Yes, um, I, it, it wasn't discrimination, it was just that I had to I had to narrow the book in some way or I would go mad. I couldn't, ha I couldn't do all, every single East European country. And for strategic and personal reasons, I chose Central Europe rather than the Balkans. Um, uh, I mean, those are all different people. Ceausescu is important later and he's, um, uh, obviously Tito is very important even in the period that I'm writing about. And he, yes, his decision to, or his attempt to uh, set, you know, create a, a form of communism which was not Stalinist, or that's what he said he was doing, or anyway not dominated by the Soviet Union, was incredibly important at the time. And it, it did, it probably helped inspire the Soviet crackdown in 1956 um, in, in Hungary. It probably inspired the Soviet Union to try and keep a tighter hold on those other countries. I mean, it was a, it was a threat to the idea that of the Soviet Union as the main source of Marxist ideology, and so on. So yes, yes, it was important, particularly in the in the fifties. Um, after Stalin's death, it became possible the, the control was loosened in, in such a way that it became possible for some leaders to do some things that were different. And that's one of the questions about how did they all begin to develop differently? Well, they all tried to stay in power in different ways. The Hungarians tried to stay in power by having a bit of capitalism and letting people uh, eat better. Uh, Ceausescu tried to stay in power by giving himself a, a sort of special identity. I'm a communist leader who has a special relationship with the West that to give himself an extra piece of legitimacy. And all of this could be tolerated so long as people towed the bottom line, which was you remain a, um, essentially a Soviet Marxist state and you don't, and you don't leave the Warsaw Pact. Um, in the case of in the case of Romania, so s certain certain rules did did this help the Soviet Union disintegrate? I think probably not. Um, but I will, I'll tell you after I've written my book about it. 
Okay. Um, there's a gentleman with the next okay. question. Yes, please. Um, I, I really enjoyed reading your book uh, last year. Um, one, one issue which you haven't touched on this evening, but which uh, it is quite interesting, I think, is the whole question of the, the non-communist political parties that existed for a short period after the war and how they were absorbed uh, into the Communist Party and how important it was to do it. Because, for example, in East Germany, they tolerated these pseudo-Christian Democrats and liberal parties right through to, the, to, to, to 1989. And I just wonder if you could maybe say a little bit more about how important it was to them to, to absorb those and why they tolerated them for several years. It's the, the fake political party was one of the great communist inventions, actually. Seriously, it was, it's been used subsequently in all kinds of places. When I first went to Tunisia uh, seven or eight years ago, before the, obviously before the revolution, I was introduced to some members of what were subsequently explained to me as fake parties. They were members of parliament who weren't from the ruling party, but everybody knew they were never going to oppose the ruling party. So this was a concept that's been used in, in many places um, uh, ever since. And it, actually, Putin has tried to reinvent it in Russia, too, not entirely successfully. But the sort of parties who are nominally different or opponents who are nominally different but who aren't really. So it's a, it's a very special um, a, a very special Soviet idea. Uh, this, is, this is connected to the whole problem for these regimes of how to be perceived by their own people as legitimate. You know, they, they felt they needed to preserve some fiction of pluralism, or in some cases, some fiction of elections. They held elections, um, even after they were no longer free elections, even if there was only one candidate on the ballot. They would hold elections year in and year out, and they would support the existence of uh, pseudo parties. There were Christian Democrats in in East Germany up until the beginning. It was sort of fake Christian Democrats, and I think there was even fake Social Democrats. Poland had a whole, even more dubious and strange. And I write about this one in the book. A, a party called Pax, which was a sort of a Catholic party that was sort of independent in some ways and sort of not, um, which I describe in, in 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 Iron Curtain. And this was an attempt to. Um, increase their legitimacy and popularity. And these were always, from the beginning, the communist parties in Eastern Europe always knew they were unpopular. I mean, in their early days, they hoped they would be popular. And they, in fact, thought they would be popular, which was why they held some free elections. There were free elections in Hungary right after the war and also in East Germany and also in Czechoslovakia. And they held those elections because they thought they would win. And they assumed that they would eventually win through, through the ballot box. It was when that didn't happen that they felt the need to use violence and other methods to, to undermine the other parties. But they also felt the need to maintain these alternate fictional parties as a way of showing, I think, that they were still somehow Western, that they tolerated opposition. They needed to look, it, it's, it's, a, it's a piece of their mentality. They needed to somehow look like they were more pluralistic than they were. And I think this was an attempt to um, you know, to, 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 to bring in members of the public. You know, if, if they could have a whole bunch of fake Christian Democrats who thought they were real Christian Democrats, that would sort of tame at least a piece of that society. So they would, at least they would kind of win over some people by allowing them to talk a little bit differently. So there were kind of tolerated forms of dissent. This, this is mostly, this becomes more of an issue in the 70s, 60s, 70s, 80s. But even in this period, they, they begin the process of creating fake parties. I think, we have, weird. I think we have time for just one more question. And I think there's <laughs> two more. Fine. We'll have them one after the other in that case. Hello. Um, I have a question just for, about something you mentioned earlier about the teaching of the history of the Gulag in Russia. And you said it wasn't very well done. I just wondered how the early Soviet period is taught in Poland and Hungary. And if it is actually taught in schools and what spin they put on the, it. You mean the post-war? Yeah. Um, Funny you should ask. I had children in Polish school for a while, and one of the things that irritated me the most is they weren't taught this so well. Um, I think they, they are taught it. It tends to be the way Polish history is taught. It's those of you who are Polish will know what I mean. You start with the Middle Ages. No, before that, you start with the cavemen, and you work through the Middle Ages and the various kings and the partitions and so on. And you do this three times, once in elementary school, once in gymnasium and middle school, and once in high school. And each time you get to the 20th century at the very end, and there's not that much time, so you have to rush through the 20th century. Um, and you get the very last week of school before summer vacation, you do Lech Wałęsa and John Paul II. 
Um, and so it's, it's in the curriculum. Um, I don't know that it's well taught, but it's not, um, but it's there. It's, it's part of the public discussion. It's also part of the public debate in a much, I don't want to, you know, just because people feel there it's uncomfortable doesn't mean it's not there. There are, there is a public debate about this period. There are historical books that are published. There was actually a recent one in Poland that got some attention about prisons in that period. So it's it's part of the conversation. I don't know that it's brilliantly well taught, but it's it's there. Last question, please. Just to um, come back to uh, Russia itself, I was going to ask you what, how you saw things unfolding there, and and whether you thought the events in the North Caucasus, where you know arguably Putin's behaving more like Stalin than than Andropov, how significant they are in the overall picture. Putin has a kind of obsession with the North Caucasus because that's how he came to power, was, by, was through the war in Chechnya. So he feels any sign that that's going wrong would, be, would somehow harm his legitimacy. So I think he's, he has an obsession about that. I'm reluctant, although I would say that he, you know, his, his behavior and his speech in particular do reflect the institutional biases of the KGB. You can see it often and in, in the people around. I would not say he's a Stalinist or that he's like Stalin. I wouldn't, I wouldn't make that comparison. Um, he's tried to do something actually more sophisticated, which is to rule Russia and, as I tolerate some dissent, but while maintaining central control. And that's very tricky, whether he can continue to do that. And it was actually rather successful for several years. Um, now the question is whether he can do that. One of the big changes is that now Russians, more and more Russians have access to the internet. So this control over television, which was so important for 10 years, um, is, is, has been undermined. Um, and the constant contact people now have with the outside world, you know, you can't cut off Russia anymore like you could in the 50s, has made the prospect of ruling it and getting people to agree and go along with it more complicated. So I, I don't want to compare him to Stalin, but he certainly, he certainly knows that history and Sooner or later, maybe he'll turn to it. Ladies and gentlemen, if you haven't read Anne's book, Iron Curtain, you are in luck, because <laughs> there, are, there, are, there are copies available at the front here, and it is a remarkable original work <coughs> of history of a very dark time. And thank you very much thank indeed for much. writing it and for being here. Thank you, thank you all.